are on Sunday nights in a study of the book of Romans. And uh, so if you turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 1, and uh, we have covered, a, uh, I say, a lot of ground. It's four messages, took us to get to verse 18. Um, that's really flying through a book like Romans for me. So, But uh, the rest of chapter 1, verses 18 down through 32, really deal with um, a subject and deal with it in a way that I would, I would like to keep it together and uh, uh, felt like uh, this is the direction we ought to go this morning and uh, cover, cover part of this and then tonight look at the rest of it. And uh, Romans chapter 1 is, uh, is an interesting chapter as it lays the groundwork and we've seen Paul's credentials and his, his desire as an apostle, his ministry, and what he, what he is doing, his desire to go be and preach in Rome. And, uh, and he says in verse 15, he says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We see the, the last uh, Sunday night, we saw the righteousness of God revealed. And in verse 18 this evening, or this morning, it's, we're going to see the wrath of God revealed. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Before God reveals his wrath, he always reveals his righteousness. Even in the scripture, we see that, that God has revealed his righteousness. And it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. God has, uh, and, and the songs this morning were a, a lot focused on heaven and seeing the Lord. Uh, this message is kind of the, the contrast to that of those who are unbelievers and uh, the wrath of God abiding on them. Uh, but it says that it's revealed, it is, it's not will be, it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Last Sunday night we covered verses 18 and 19 a little bit, but they're, they're needed to set the context for this morning. The term ungodliness refers to a lack of respect for God, and the term unrighteousness speaks of violating God's law or behaving in an unjust kind of way. And so we see those who are ungodly, they, they disregard what God uh, wants, they don't, they don't fear God, they don't, they're not concerned about what God's word says, and then we see the unrighteous, which are people that violate God's, God's word and they violate God's law. <clears throat> And the Bible says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold not the truth or who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, that we live in, and I this passage of scripture is more relevant to the society that we live in today than it ever has been. We live in a society that has no respect for God. They are ungodly and that they violate God's law on a, on a regular basis. That makes them unrighteousness. And we are seeing, in my opinion, in, especially in America, we are seeing God remove his hand of blessing and we're beginning to see how his wrath is revealed against these things. And our society, as it, as it crumbles all around us, uh, we, we as believers... We don't need to be worried about that and, and, and fretting over that and wringing our hands over that. That is the natural result of a society that has left God. It's a natural result of a society that, that has rejected God. You and I as believers in Jesus Christ don't have to worry about the wrath of God being revealed at us. The Bible says that we are saved from wrath. God's wrath has passed over us. It is, it is not going to touch us. Now, we will live in a world, and as the world goes the wrong direction, life will uh, undoubtedly become more difficult and be more difficult. And we, To be a Christian, we'll face persecution and things of that nature. But we are not under the wrath of God. We, are not, we don't have to worry about this. But we do need to understand that this is what is coming and this is what is happening now. And it's only going to get worse and worse for those who are ungodly and unrighteous. It's never going to get better for them. It's only going to keep getting worse. That's why the, the 
impetus is on us to go into all the world and preach the gospel because it's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that can deliver them from their ungodliness and their unrighteousness into the righteousness of Christ and can save them from the wrath of God. Nothing else will work. There, there's no amount of social programs uh, that will help this world. We know that because we've thrown, uh, since the war on poverty began under Lyndon Johnson, uh, it really ought to have been named the war on prosperity because it's destroyed our country economically, but we have transferred over $20 trillion of wealth to the poor, and yet we have more poverty than we did when we started the process. There's no amount of money in the world that can stop people from being poor because poverty is generally the result of the choices you make, not the income you bring in. In fact, I don't even know why we're celebrating Labor Day tomorrow because it seems like there's more people in our country sitting home collecting unemployment than out getting a job. Every place you go to, it has a hiring sign in the window. Most of the restaurants you go to say that our lobby's closed because we just don't have enough help. Why are we paying people not to work when there's plenty of places to work? But when we have a country that leaves God, that's the way, that's the way we define compassion in our society is giving people money when they can't find the job that they really like or if they just don't feel like working. We just, we just take money from people who are working and give it to them. Actually, we've been taking money from the Chinese government for a long time and giving it to them because we're out of money. We, we spend far more than we take in in tax revenue. Our society has the troubles it's in, not, not because of a virus, not because of, not because of the global economic system, not because of the rise and fall of, of any uh, governmental system or anything like that. America has all the troubles that it has can all be traced back to the fact that we have abandoned this book. And our society is not only ungodly, but it's unrighteous. We don't even respect God anymore. I have no, uh, no doubt in my mind that Brother Chacon is going to see far more fruit winning Hispanic people to Christ than we will see winning Americans to Christ because the Hispanic people still think they need God and the Americans don't. We live in a world that's going to be more hostile to it. And you don't have to worry about getting mad or anything like that because the wrath of God is already on the way. Uh, and he's far better at wrath than you and I are. What we ought to do is remember that those people that are God haters, I shared with the, with the men in the men's prayer breakfast yesterday as we were talking about being you know, men of prayer and developing a consistent prayer life. In, in the last page of my book, I, I have for people that I'm praying to be saved. And, and the people that call here to the church or they post on our Facebook page some nasty message because they got one of our door hangers on their door and they post some nasty foul thing on there, I just add them to my prayer list for salvation by name. And, uh, and so now I'm praying for you. Ha, ha, ha. You thought the door hanger was bad? Now you've got a preacher praying for you to get saved. Now things are going to get bad. God, do whatever it takes to bring them to salvation. And, and I don't know whether some of these people will ever be saved or not, but I hope so. And I would love one day for one of the people that, you know, call and leave a nasty message or post something nasty on our Facebook page, one day to be getting baptized in that tank because they received Christ as their Savior and now want to be a member of the church that they cussed out for bothering to leave a door hanger on their door. The wrath of God is coming. Our job is to rescue as many of them as we can. We've got to be careful we don't have the attitude of, yes, come on, wrath, let's go, wrath. But for the grace of God, we would be under that wrath. Verse 19, because that, because that which may be known of God is manifest, or it's shown in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's you and I, we're the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
So the ones that are God rejectors and the ones that run around and say, I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe in that, every person who's ever lived on this earth at one time or another did believe in God because it's written into our heart. The fact that there is an eternal, all-powerful God is known to every person on this planet by virtue of the fact that you can look at this creation and you can see his eternal power and his Godhead in creation. You don't have to see God. The fact that you can see this is you can see God. Uh, explain to me, if you take God out of the equation, explain to me how this universe came into being. If this universe was created by someone, somewhere, some time ago, what kind of a being could create this expansive universe filled with stars and filled with planets and filled with all kinds of wonderful things and, and weird things and awesome things and yet create this planet and the life that is on it and the diversity of, of creatures that are on this planet and the perfect balance of our, our ecosystem and the fact that we're, we're just far away enough from the sun not to burn up and we're not, not that far away that we freeze to death. That this works so orderly. What level of intelligence and power would it take to make this universe? See, if you believe somebody created this universe, then you already believe in the Godhead, the eternal Godhead, and the power of God, because you would have to have an eternal, all-powerful being in order to create this universe. You could not have a limited being. You could not have a, a being that that was born and came into this creation because something would have had to create it. That's the problem evolutionists have. You know, they, they believe, you know, 100 billion years ago or whatever it is, a bunch of rocks in space got together and then, you know, they, they just made themselves round and that's where the earth came from. They formed a gravitational field all by themselves and they just packed each other nice and tight and then it formed this ball and then somewhere water came about and then some, you know, and billions and billions of years these wonderful accidents just keep happening. And, you know, the problem with evolution is you say, okay, well, where did those rocks come from? Oh, well, they came from the Big Bang. Okay, well, what exploded? Where did that come from? Well, we're not sure, but there's some forces, and we're sure someday we'll understand how the forces can work together to take nothing and make it explode into something. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't have a lot of confidence in science, because they believe dumb things like that. I don't know about you, I just believe that God created the heaven and earth. And if, if he created it, that tells me he's got to be eternal, because he's not created. And he's got to be all-powerful because, I mean, just look at this universe and tell me that there's a limit to the power of the creator of this universe. So you know what? Nobody has an excuse when they stand before God. Pastor, what about the people who've never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ? They are without excuse. That's why the command is not keep your mouth shut because the people that don't hear go to heaven. The command is to go tell them because the wrath of God is going to be revealed on them. There's no excuse. Every third world tribe, every aboriginal tribe or native tribe somewhere has a, a theological system that they've constructed. Because any dummy can look at this universe and go, there must be a God. In fact, you know there's a word that the Bible uses for people who don't believe that there is a God? The word is fool. It says in verse 20, for the invisible things of him, the things that you can't see about God from the creation of the world. Because of creation, we can see these things. They are clearly seen. Invisible things are clearly seen because of creation. Being understood by the things that are made. Everybody at one time believed in God. Because you, nobody's born a fool. 
You have to become a fool. So that they are without excuse, even as eternal power in God had, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You know what the Bible says? Everybody knew God. Not know him in the sense of, of saving knowledge, but they knew God. By virtue of the fact that they were here to ask the question, who am I, where did I come from, where am I going? They knew God. And it says when they knew him, they glorified him not as God, neither were, what's the next word? Thankful. You know where idolatry comes from? It comes from not being thankful. You know the pagan cultures that bow down to stone and wood and different objects? You know how their theological system formed? Formed from unthankfulness. They looked, they knew some things about God, and then they said, you know what, let's, let's cut down a tree and carve it into a God, and we'll bow down to the tree. Let's take some stone, we'll carve it into something, we'll bow down to that. We'll call it our God, we'll, we'll worship it, we'll, we'll bring the wooden idol, we'll bring it food and things that it can't eat. And we'll pray to it, to ears that can't hear. They glorified not God. You know, God has chosen to reveal himself three ways. He's revealed himself through our own conscience. I preached on this uh, about a month or two ago in verse 19 that, uh, that uh, God has showed it to us. They're just, we're just known of him. He's revealed himself through, through our conscience that there's a knowledge of God. There's a knowledge of God's law written in us. He's revealed himself through, through his Holy Spirit and that bringing conviction, that convincing of our sin and, and all of uh, that. He's revealed himself through creation so that we can see his power and the fact that he's eternal. And when they knew him, they rejected him. There, there is always at the root of every false theological system, there is the root of disbelief. Not unbelief, but disbelief. Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, they, uh, Eve especially, disbelieved God. And Adam disbelieved God, and they did what he told them not to do. They said, oh, wait a minute, we could be like gods, let's help ourselves. And they took of the fruit. They, they disbelieved what God told them to do. Then you have Cain and Abel, the next generation. And you have Cain offering a sacrifice that God did not tell him to offer. And it was the wrong kind of sacrifice. And God did not have respect to the offering that he was not supposed to bring. Cain disbelieved God and he did what he wanted to do. And then he got mad when God would not respect or have any use for his offering which was offered in disbelief. Not unbelief, disbelief. Disbelief is when you know the truth and you reject it. Unbelief is when you don't know the truth. He knew the truth and he rejected it. And you can keep going down through uh, and, and see how when the gospel was there and the gospel was in a certain area and then they just disbelieved God and the result of that was a, a culture of people uh, condemned to, uh, to idolatry. Noah, when he and his three sons got off the ark, they all had the truth. But somewhere along the line, there was a disbelief, a rejection of the truth of God. He had flooded the world there were eight eyewitnesses to the fact he had flooded the world. All of the descendants of Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all of them 
uh, would have been told and would have known. God just flooded the earth. He judged the earth. We remember what the earth was like before the flood. And people were wicked and they were evil and they couldn't stop thinking about evil all the time. And God just had enough and he judged the world and he flooded it. He promised he'd never flood it again, but he never promised he wouldn't judge it again. So we better live by what God tells us to live by. And somewhere along the line they said, we reject that. Let's build us a tower. Let's make us a name for ourselves. Let it stretch into the heavens. Let's have everybody look to us. We're, we are going to do what we want to do. We're not going to let God tell us anymore. See it down through the centuries. You can see it within Christianity, places that once had the gospel that are even talked about in the New Testament. The church at Rome, by the way, one point in time had the truth of the gospel. And somewhere along the line, they rejected this and built a new theological system called the Roman Catholic Church which is based on disbelief. They've rejected this book. Do you know the Arab people are descendants of Abraham, just like the Jewish people are? You know that Abraham's descendants through Isaac, they received the promise they didn't always follow it, but they received the promise and they had it. The descendants of Ishmael rejected and disbelieved the promise and went about to build their own society, their own theological society. Then the Jewish people having the gospel during the time of the divided kingdoms began to reject and disbelieve the word of God. And they turned to idols. And God sent his judgment upon them. The United States of America was once a country founded on the truth of God's word. Now we are a country that disbelieves the Bible. Disbelief is a far worse place to be than unbelief. Unbelief is merely ignorance. Disbelief is a rejection. America has rejected God's word. More and more, this world has rejected God's world. Uh, places that once used to be, uh, like Great Britain, used to be one of the most uh, heavily involved in missions. And now they have almost no gospel witness left in them at all. They disbelieve. They knew God and they rejected him. Well, what's the result of that? They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. One of the most important habits as believers we need to develop is that of being thankful. Eve wasn't thankful for what God had given her. He'd given her every tree of the Garden of Eden to eat from except one, and she couldn't be satisfied with it. Samson was unthankful in his life. God had raised him up to be a judge. He was a miserable judge. He was a terrible role model, and he died in shame. He was just never thankful. No, I want that woman. No, I want to do it this way. No, I want to do it that way. God said, fine, I'll let Delilah give you a haircut. We'll see how it works for you. And the life of Samson is one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. The Bible says after his hair was cut that he woke up and he shook himself as before and he wist or he knew not that God had departed from him. He disbelieved. He rejected what he knew was true. It goes on to say that they became, but became vain in their imaginations. 
So when you reject God and you're not thankful for what God has given you and has done for you, your thought life degenerates. The word imagination there refers to our reasoning center. It's not about our daydreams. Our, the way we think and the way we reason is, becomes degenerated. You've already rejected God. You're already unthankful for what God has done for you. And so you become vain. You become foolish. You become what we see a lot of people are in our society. It, it's a shame when you see people that grew up in church, they heard the gospel, but they never received it. They, they didn't like the rules that the church had, and they didn't like the, the type of messages that were, were preached there. They didn't like the, the sense of modesty that was trying to be instilled in them. They didn't like the separation from the world that the church stood for. They weren't thankful for the godly upbringing that they were being given. And so when they got old enough, they got out of church, and they left church, and they, they, they go online, and they talk about how bad uh, those Baptists are, and they talk about how bad those fundamentalists are, and they talk about how bad this they don't let you have any fun and they don't let you do anything and they don't let you this and all of that and their reasoning center has been degenerated by the fact that they've not only rejected God but they weren't thankful for what they were given in the first place and now they're out there running blogs and websites you know pointing out this and pointing out that and pointing out this you think what a waste of your life what you need to do is get saved. Many of them now claim that they're atheists or they don't believe in God or they're at best they're agnostic and they, they rejected all that stuff and it doesn't work and it's this and it's that and you can go online, you can, I don't recommend you do that and you can look at all this stuff. But these are, these are just the ramblings of foolish people who are degenerated in their reasoning ability. Here's the problem. When you get to this stage and you can't reason properly, how are we supposed to win somebody to Christ when they can't reason the truth any longer? When they become unreasonable in the way you're trying to share with them the truth and they just don't get it because they're too far degenerated. That's why while hurling hateful and vile and vicious insults at people who stand for traditional marriage accuse us of being, uh, you know, uninclusive and mean and hateful. Can I tell you that people who stand for traditional marriage, who reject homosexuality as a sin, who reject same-sex marriage as an abomination, are not hateful. We are the most loving people that there are. And we love you so much that we want to tell you about Jesus Christ who can get you out of that destructive lifestyle and get you into a normal, healthy lifestyle, one that you can be happy and fulfilled in. We love you enough to tell you you're headed for the wrath of God in your life. You know, the Bible says if you love your children as parents that you'll spank them. You'll correct them quick, be times, early, fast, don't wait till they're five and they're a rebellious five when they're little and they, you see the sin nature kicking in. Wash it. The Bible says if you hate your kids, you don't do that. You know why? There's, you train your child to let its sin nature run it, run him or her. You hate your kid because you're setting your kid up for the wrath of God in this life someday. you love your kid, you'll discipline them. You'll teach them right from wrong. You'll teach them that there's a penalty for doing the wrong thing so that when they're old enough to understand that Jesus died for the penalty for their sin, they can understand it and they can receive Christ at a young age and they can grow up in the faith of the gospel and walk in the ways of God and avoid the wrath of God and the stupid mistakes that people make before they come to Christ. I don't have any regrets that I missed out on running around with a bunch of women or doing drugs or getting drunk or any of those things. I've never been drunk. I've never drank alcohol. I've never taken drugs. I've never smoked a cigarette. My parents would have killed me if I ever thought about doing it. They would have known if I was even thinking about doing it. it just killed me right then and there. You know what? I'm glad for that. 
I don't have a DUI on my record. I don't have a jail record. I don't, I don't have the scars that go with the unrighteous life. I'm not perfect. But the Christian education and the upbringing my parents gave me saved me from a lot of those things. And some of you got saved as adults and you bear some of those scars and you know those things. And if you are normal in any way, you don't want your children repeating the mistakes you make. You've been divorced. Nobody who's divorced says, boy, I hope my kids grow up someday and get divorced like me. Uh, when, when we preach against, you know, divorce and say, if you can avoid it, if, you know, as much as two people can work together and solve these problems, if you're believers, there's, you should be able to do that and, and not do that. It's not because we hate divorced people. It's because we know that that's not good. We're trying to spare them from something. And by the way, the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to save any marriage. It just takes two people who are willing to obey God. Two people filled with the Spirit can't bring themselves to get divorced. But it takes two. And even as the scripture says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. You know, there, sometimes there's just a hard heart involved and there's just nothing you can do. But it doesn't mean we hate divorced people. The degenerated reasoning is where we're at. I mean, this is where we're at in our society. And I think we're even moving into the next thing, which is at the end of verse 21. It says, and their foolish heart was darkened. They became vain or foolish in their imaginations. And now that they are foolish, their foolish heart is darkened. In the Bible, the heart is the seat of the intellect. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible describes the seed of the emotions as being the bowels. It's just their cultural way of viewing things. And the Bible talks about our bowels of compassion, bowels of mercies and kindness. It's where the emotions are thought to come from. So when you read the Bible and you see the word heart, we're not thinking about that that organ or that, that part of us that feels hurt and, you know, we have a broken heart and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about where we think and where we reason and our intellectual ability, our intellectual capacity. The Bible says their heart went dark. Vain imaginations... A degenerated way of reasoning might logically be the result of a darkened heart, but in this case, the Bible tells us that their heart was darkened because of their foolish imagination. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, I'm gonna, you don't have to flip there. I'm going to flip there real quick, though. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, the Bible says, But they, hardened, uh, they hard, uh, hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Isn't it funny today how the English language is perverted in order to make that which is evil sound good and that which is good sound evil? People who believe that murdering unborn babies in the womb is a civilized thing call themselves progressives. As if going from believing children are special and burying them and raising them and protecting them and giving them every, all the nurture and admonition we can is somehow the wrong way of thinking about it. In reality, we are the progressive ones. They are the regressive ones. We're supposed to be the backward, dumb hicks who just believe that it's marriages between one man and one woman because that's I mean just that's the way God created it but it just make even to a lost person that just makes sense we're, we're the ones who believe that your bio, biological sex is not determined by what box you check on your birth certificate but by your biology I mean I just I don't know about you if you all agree with me on this I believe boys are boys and girls are girls 
The doctor is not assigning sex at birth. The doctor is recognizing sex at birth. It's a boy. Oh, why did you assign that child boy as their sex or male? I just felt like it, you know, heads it's a boy, tails it's a girl. No. There's biology involved. I mean, we don't believe cows can change their gender. We don't put two bulls in a corral and hope they breed. If you're dumb enough to try that, you should go out in the ring with those two bulls and get between them, try and break them up. Yet, yeah, we're the ones who are called hateful and idiotic and stuck in the, we're, 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 we're cavemen. You know, we're, we're too dumb to think of things. No, we're not the dumb ones. They're the dumb ones. Their heart is so dark that they can't even recognize biology anymore. Ten years ago, we were not having conversations in this country about which bathrooms people should use. We, we were not having to deal with, and I have a teenage daughter. My teenage daughter is not going to go to a school where they're going to allow a boy to go shower with her after gym class. Not happening. I'll homeschool, I'll Christian school, I'll get three jobs if I have to. I'm not sending my child to a school where they're going to let boys into my daughter's locker room. Not happening. I'm not the dumb one. I'm the smart one. I'm the one who can still think. You know, we use another word the wrong way. We use the word woke to describe the most unconscious people in the country. Those who are woke. Those who are woke just have had their foolish heart darkened. That's the definition of wokeness from the Bible. That's how you get to woke ideology, is you first have to reject God, and you have to be unthankful for everything you have, and then you become a fool, and your heart goes dark. Can't think anymore. You have no common sense. I, I, I thought some of the things that we argue about, seriously argue about as policy in our country, was just common sense stuff. Should we kill children, or should we not kill children? See, I think it's just common sense that we don't. Should we have male and female bathrooms? I think it's just common sense that we do. These are not difficult concepts. So in verse 19, or verse 18, when it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, you're beginning to understand why. These people are, they're beyond reasoning with. We run into them at Fourth Friday. We run into them when we're knocking on doors. We run into them all over the place where they think we are the problem. They're so far gone in their thinking, they, they think we are the problem. They're not even trying to convince us that they're right. They're just trying to shut us up because it's their way or the highway. You can't be on YouTube or Facebook and say the things you're saying, Pastor. That's because we live in a foolish society whose heart's been darkened. They became fools. Look at what it says in verse 22. For professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They think they're the smartest people in the room, and yet they're the dumbest that we have ever met in our life. The term fool is not a word that's used lightly in the Bible. In fact, Jesus warned in Matthew 5, 22, that it, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. The word fool means exactly what you think it does. It's where we get our word moron from in the Greek. You know what God says about people when their foolish heart is darkened? They're literally just, they're morons. By the way, do you know moron used to be a medical term? I mean, they just diagnosed people as being a moron. That's the way it was. I think we should bring back that diagnosis because it's running rampant. It's an epidemic. It's worse than COVID. 
moronity, or mor whatever you want to call it, being a moron, is the greatest pandemic we've ever seen in the world. Our world's full of morons. They're full of fools who look at this creation and say, oh, look at what the Big Bang did billions of years ago, and boy, aren't, all, aren't we glad all those accidents worked out just so? No, that child that's a few minutes away from being born, who's actually in the birth canal, no, go ahead and take a pair of forceps and jam it into its brain stem and kill it and suck its brains out and cut it up into little pieces, throw it in the dumpster. No, the, that man wants to go and use the ladies' bathroom and wants, those boys want to go in and be with the girls in the showers at the school. That's fine. We, we don't want to hurt their feelings, so we should let them go. If they say they're girls, then they're girls. It's biology, you know. Biology is not about science. Biology is about how you feel. And you parents that you discipline your children when they do wrong, when they don't follow the rules, and they, they, get in, they start being rebellious, and you punish them, you're the problem. You're squelching their personalities. You need to let them express themselves. We've got a bunch of people expressing themselves. We've got prisons full of people who express themselves. What we needed was more dads with a leather belt. Our prisons wouldn't be near so full if we had more men who disciplined their children properly. In love, there's a right way to do it, not being abusive. Correcting our children, teaching them there's a consequence for doing the wrong thing. And then look what it says in verse 23, and we'll finish here and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Rather than worship God, rather than worship the eternal, powerful God that everybody who's ever been born knows exists, They've rejected him and replaced him with a God that they create and they control. Idolatry started with the rejection of God and then being unthankful for what was happening, what they had. And then their reasoning began to be degenerated and they became fools and now they've taken the glory of God and dumbed it down to a bird or a frog or a goat. There's God sitting on his throne. He's created everything, and he's watched mankind reject him, even though they know who he is because he put it in them to know. They knew him, and they rejected him, and they were ungrateful towards him. And they just decided, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And then they began to worship whatever they felt like worshiping. You don't think a holy and righteous God isn't going to sit up there one day and take his wrath and pour it out? You don't think America is going to suffer because we have rejected God? I believe it is. And this isn't the happy message that y'all came for today, right? And we're going to look at the, the next part of this tonight. But can I just finish with this thought? We can either, as believers, start holding up. Let's just hang on till Jesus comes. Or we can do everything we can to get the gospel to as many people as we can. Because the day of wrath is coming. The day of God settling the score is coming. There's a whole book at the end of your Bible that describes what God's wrath is going to look like. It's not a pretty sight. 75%, and that's a rough estimate based on what's in Scripture, probably 75% of the world's population is going to die in a seven-year period because God 
pouring out his wrath. And the Bible goes on to say that if it wasn't for the fact that God cut that short, if he had let it go on longer, the entire world's population would be dead. But he, he's cutting it short. That's how fearsome his wrath is. There's a world that's starting to experience it now and is going to be experiencing it for all of eternity if they don't get saved. Yes, we need to think about our families and isolating them from what's coming in the world, but we need to not forget our mission. There are people out there that are not morons. They've not yet become fools. They haven't rejected God and done what they want to do. So let's go find them. Let's try and get them the gospel. Let's pray for them. Let's love them and get them on the winning team before God decides it's time. I've had enough. And he sends his wrath on this earth. Let's stand together for closing prayer.